Okay, all right, seeing that it's eight o'clock, I think we'll get started. Um, thanks to everyone for being so timely this morning. Um, and thanks to the Public Square team for choosing a very relevant tune to get us started off. Um, welcome to Vancouver's Future Economy, pros Prosperous, Sustainable, Resilient. Um, the fourth event in the Future We Want, the Change We Need series on planning for the future of Vancouver together. My name is Veronica Belitsky, and along with Peter Hall, who you'll be meeting shortly, we'll be moderating and guiding you through the conversation this morning. As we begin our event, Vanessa Campbell has kindly agreed to offer us a humkaminum welcome to start our dialogue today. I'll pass it off to you, Vanessa. I try. Vanessa Quinnesquich e Tinitzent Mathquiam. Ami tap quit wheelum e Tinash Mathquimat Tamoch Tush Ahmets Tas Hunt Caminum Clan. E Tlu Tush Alequa Tis Huamich e Tis a little with heart, Miss Dale. Ni tenth kiltum nisyea quince hunt caminum can Sasu tu hua aikwet kwaloen Stare quenus yoenish tat santen e hilak stoch te huinath e mech netten Tia tala ten te swallop huinamet hui to e Ni ta was heath nem ye eggs, ye aeus, tat a wit to snemeth, Miss Dale. Ni he shatlam it to na tamo, e would cleat to sies, mock swale. Ni yo aitat quelloen, cus tu cachtak, the Miss Dale. The new sets in wak talus. I tap her to swallow quith the alap quith me at a na well. I turn a quellwen quince e quits nala. E heal up stala to natalmo e e to e. When e when a with a quith no way yet. I tap her. Good morning, everyone. My name is Vanessa Campbell, and I'm from the Musqueam Nation. Um, it's my honor to be with you today to speak and represent my elders and my community. Um, I was initially asked by one of my very close friends to speak to you um, in Hunt Caminum and welcome you all to our traditional territory. Um, but because the world has shifted to this online platform, I wanted to focus a little bit more on um, just really helping set a good tone for the start of your gathering uh, to help ground your minds and your hearts in a good place. Um, and most importantly, to thank you all for creating a space at the beginning of this important work uh, to recognize the traditional territory of the land that Vancouver has grown up on. Um, and thank you for honoring us by taking a moment to really understand what that means to each of you. Um, I hope you have a really great morning and hi chran, hi tapka. Thank you very much, uh, Vanessa, for uh, uh, welcoming us to, to the territories um, of, of your people today um, and for setting us off on a, on a, on a good way. Um, I uh, personally am, am joining this meeting um, from uh, the territories of the Kakai people um, in, the, in the place that's known as New Westminster. Um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here with everybody today. Um, I'd like to um, start by um, uh, introducing um, Gil Kelly, the uh, General Manager of Planning uh, for the City of Vancouver. Um, Gil came to Vancouver with experience of Portland of Berkeley, of San Francisco. In other words, he came here with uh, knowledge and experience of uh, potential urban economies that we might want and also potential urban economies that we might not want. And uh, it's a great pleasure to, um, to uh, welcome Gil to, um, to officially open this from the perspective of the city. Uh, thank you, Peter. Can you all hear me?
my audio coming through? You're good, Gail. Okay, thanks so much, Seth. Uh, well, good morning, everyone, and thank you all for coming uh, early today on a, a really important topic to uh, the future of the city, uh, our ability to shape the kind of city we want over the coming decades. Um, and that's really what the Vancouver plan is all about. <clears throat> There's also a very important second stream of activity along with articulating uh, those larger changes for the city's future, which is a more current stream of action while planning. So as we plan Vancouver together, one result is the Vancouver plan. Uh, the next uh, uh, stream of activity uh, that um, travels in parallel with that is action while planning, where a number of initiatives, initiatives including um, uh, changes to enable uh, economic innovation and inclusiveness are um, as well being, being uh, initiated by, uh, in many cases, by the city council um, so that uh, we're not waiting for the end of the plan to make um, changes in line with some of those future uh, emerging uh, bigger moves uh, with regard to the economy we'd like to do. So it's an exciting time to be planning Vancouver together and just wanted to nest this uh, discussion within that larger, uh, larger frame for planning Vancouver together. I'm very pleased that you're all here today. This is a key topic in the Vancouver plan and threads its way through uh, all kinds of uh, other components of the plan, but to sort of pull out and articulate what does it mean to have a healthy and resilient economy that serves all is certainly an important theme uh, in the work and in both of those streams of activity. So I'd like to very much thank uh, uh, our partners at SFU for hosting this, our partners with the Vancouver Economic Commission who participated in, in this, uh, and to this group of panelists, which I think you'll find have a very um, uh, unique set of perspectives, all, all differing, but all contributory and all important to hear. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of uh, uh, many city councilors here on the call this morning, um, their commitment to this kind of planning work, um, the sort of new kind of planning that we want to do to really ensure that Vancouver you know, has a healthy, resilient uh, future and that the plan um, stakes out not only big moves, but, but also is able to evolve and adapt over time. Uh, a commitment on the city council's part, uh, even while there are many pressing urgent issues to carry both those streams in, in, their, in their minds and, and in their uh, authority over city actions is really, really key to this. So I'd like to acknowledge that uh, Councillor Re Rebecca Bly, Councillor Christine Boyle, Councillor Adrian Carr, uh, Councillor Melissa DiGenova, uh, Councillor Lisa Dominato, Councillor Pete Fry, Councillor Sarah Kirby Young, Councillor Jean Swanson, uh, and Councillor Michael Weeb uh, have or will be joining us this morning for this conversation. So thank you very much, uh, Councillors, for, for attending. <clears throat> Uh, as I said, the uh, Vancouver plan is really meant to be the guiding mechanism and decision-making framework um, that spans a number of critical components of city life and, and community building, uh, and the economy is, is one of those. Um, and I think today's um, dialogues will uh, present you with a number of, um, a, a number of different perspectives on, on that topic uh, and how we might advance um, sort of the shaping uh, of a dynamic and a economy that serves uh, that serves all residents of Vancouver uh, and allows for uh, innovation uh, and progress at the same time, tending to uh, shared prosperity, if you will. So that's that's really the the sort of cohesive uh, element here, um, and would like to sort of keep that in focus and help define that through these uh, various perspectives. There'll be many opportunities to continue to engage uh, in the planning effort going forward. Uh, including a focus on the economy, uh, and you'll see some uh, information later in the in the uh, chat today about uh, how you can uh, connect with a, a series of ongoing activities, including other series uh, that SFU is sponsoring uh, through the dialogues uh, piece that will be coming up over the next uh, uh, six weeks or so. Um, again, just a, a few touch points that, that I think you'll hear more detail about from the panelists that are important to keep in mind. We do have um, uh, several um, aspects of what I would call community anxiety about the future, which um, both the current recession and the pandemic have uh, accentuated um, further gaps in um, equity and, uh, uh, and income and access to the goods of society. Those have been widened and have really revealed some of the structural uh, deficits in, in Vancouver not only with regard to, to housing uh, and transport, but with regard 
to the economy itself and the ability to get and retain uh, jobs. Um, the uh, economy clearly has both potential and huge impacts on, on um, uh, the environmental uh, goals that the city has, the uh, climate uh, uh, impact um, and, and our ability to not only um, lower greenhouse gas emissions through a series of measures, but also to um, mitigate the impacts that are already sort of baked into the, the climate emergency, um, you know, including things like sea level rise, increasing weather events, urban flooding, um, uh, poor air quality in summers, um, and so forth and so on. So there are connections back to how the economy functions and how well it serves those objectives to, to attend to those uh, things as well. And, and I guess finally, uh, again, on the notion of equity, small businesses have been hit really, really hard. Uh, many of those are run um, not by large corporations, but by local um, people. Um, and often there are a component of that are minority owned businesses uh, and the ability to uh, have a healthy small business and retail sector uh, here is an important piece of community life going forward. Those are under stress. So part of what we investigate is in this series is uh, how best to position and help uh, locally grown businesses. And then finally, I would just say the um, ability to work directly with the, the First Nations here um, on in within their entrepreneurial um, endeavors uh, and learn from their way of doing things and, and that heritage, which is very rich, uh, as they um, increasingly enter the urban economy uh, here is an important piece uh, to keep uh, to keep our mind on. We'll, we'll explore things like the circular economy or some cases what people call the donut economy, uh, ways to make sure that more benefit stays here. I would just say that Vancouver is on the cusp, so this is not a hypothetical or theoretical conversation. Um, we're seeing enormous um, interest from the part of both local and international uh, firms, particularly in the high tech and clean tech and biotech arena, wanting to either move to or start operations within Vancouver. And that itself will have a transformative effect uh, both good and bad potentially uh, on Vancouver's uh, housing market, on Vancouver's uh, social identity uh, and equity. And so uh, getting hold of that and being able to guide that kind of transformation is a key objective here in formulating um, plans and policies that, uh, that will shape that economy to our benefit in the future. So I'll stop it there and just um, really thank SFU and the panelists for coming today. Uh, and enlightening us with their perspectives. So thank you very much. I'll turn it back. Thanks, Gil, for being here with us and for providing some really important context as we launch into our conversation today. Um, and we'll be walking everyone through some housekeeping notes and some notes on how you can participate over the next uh, two hours or so. Um, but first, Peter and I wanted to introduce ourselves um, as uh, moderators guiding you through this conversation over uh, two hours. Um, so my name is Veronica, um, and I'm joining in from the unceded and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, and I'm born and raised here on these territories. My, uh, my parents immigrated here a few years before I was born from Poland, um, but I've had the immense privilege of growing up um, and being raised here on these territories. Um, and um, I think a lot of my um, interests and um, excitement, especially for this conversation, conversations about the future of our city come from having grown up here. Um, and I get to do a lot of this work and, and dreaming about our future through my role at City Hive, um, where we work on engaging youth in, in shaping our city. That's a little bit about me. How about you, Peter? Great, thanks, Veronica. Um, my name is Peter Hall. I'm uh, on the uh, faculty uh, in the Urban Studies program at Simon Fraser University. Um, I am uh, currently spending a few years in, in academic administration where uh, we also have to engage in planning processes, where we also have to um, use the planning process and the tools of planning to um, build consensus amongst uh, people whose interests don't always align with each other. And, um, and it's also really important uh, when we do that, that we, we keep our values and uh, our, our, our kind of end goals, our shared end goals in mind. 
Um, I think that uh, part of what makes this conversation um, today really exciting is that it is connected to such a planning process. And I, I would like to think that we've started off with some uh, long-term goals in mind. Um, and, uh, and an important part of that is acknowledging that, uh, that many of us, certainly myself uh, as a settler um, to, to Canada, um, I was born uh, in, in South Africa, grew up there, and uh, I'm very lucky that I have been able to make my home here in Vancouver um, uh, since then. We have, um, we have uh, partners today that Gil has already mentioned. I just want to emphasize again that this is a partnership between the City of Vancouver and the Vancouver Plan Team. Um, today's uh, event also includes the Vancouver Economic Commission. Uh, and then on the SFU side, it's a partnership between the city program, um, SFU Urban Studies, um, our Office of Community Engagement, and uh, of course, the Public Square um, folks who, um, who, are, who are doing all of the work to, to keep, us, uh, keep us going. Um, I'm gonna hand back to Veronica for uh, some uh, housekeeping. Um, so yes, a few housekeeping notes. The event today is being recorded um, and there is closed captioning available for today's event. You can turn it on and off by clicking the CC button on the black bar at the bottom of your screen. It should be on your right. You'll also see that we have ASL interpreters. Um, and should you need any assistance with our ASL interpretation or closed captioning, please private message Tech Help Kim, um, who you'll see being active in the chat. So you can click on her name if you would like to um, get some tech help or help with ASL interpretation. And if you run into any technical difficulties, you can private message Kim. Um, and instructions on all of the above will be posted in the chat as well, so you have that in. Um, so what will today's event look like? In a few minutes, we'll, we'll all be hearing from Andy Yan, who will be providing us with an insightful overview of Vancouver's economic landscape. Afterwards, you'll hear from seven speakers who all do incredible work that represents the different facets of Vancouver's economic landscape. They'll be sharing their thoughts and perspectives on what a prosperous, sustainable, and resilient economy looks like. Then we'll open it up to a round of questions for the whole panel, as well as the questions submitted by you in the Q&A uh, throughout this event. So there are a few ways for you to engage throughout the event. Um, first is through the Q&A. You can type questions at any point during the panel discussion using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If your question is for a particular speaker, you can type at and then their name at the beginning so we know who your question is being directed for. And you can also upvote questions that you're particularly interested in hearing answered and they'll rise to the top. You can also engage in conversation during the event using the Padlet Jamboards. Um, the Jamboard links will be dropped in the chat again. Um, and there will be several idea boards and Jamboards, and each is dedicated to discussion on a different question related to today's event. And a big thanks to the FSU Urban Studies students who will be moderating these boards. Um, and the links have been dropped in the chat with instructions on how to use the Padlet Jamboards. Um, if you haven't used them, um, you'll be taken uh, away from the Zoom uh, webinar environment when you do click on them. So please don't feel obligated to join them and know that it's a separate platform. If you're overwhelmed hearing about these other ways of engaging, you can just listen in today if it's all okay. Uh, and we have some community guidelines uh, to make sure that we're all here understanding the same terms for engaging with one another. Um, there will be zero tolerance for those who promote discrimination or harm against others, and we'll be uh, those folks will be removed at the discretion of our technical team and moderator. Um, we ask that everyone please be as present as possible as you can be. We know you have a lot going on in the morning, though. Um, respect the opinions of others and where everyone is coming from. Please don't assume pronouns or gender or the knowledge based on someone's name or video image. Um, and if you need to uh, take a break at any point, um, you know that we're not uh, holding your feet to the fire to be sitting in front of your screen. So feel free to, to uh, grab a refill of coffee, uh, uh, some breakfast, and whatever you need to, to be as present as possible. Um, and lastly, step up, step back. So if you've already asked a number of questions um, or shared a number of comments in the chat, um, maybe give a bit of time and space for others to, to, to jump in with their questions and comments.
Okay, so to jump into the content of today's event and why this conversation and why now, um, you, you just heard some really important context um, from Gil about the Vancouver plan and the opportunity that that presents. Um, and the pandemic has magnified challenges, shortcomings and failings of our current economic systems and practices. And this is an opportunity for us to reflect and allow us to expand our notion of the economy, shift how we center equity and reprioritize so we don't go back to how things were prior. Um, and I'll pass it off to you, Peter, to provide some more context. Great, thanks, Veronica. Um, you know, we, we think about the Vancouver economy as um, a, a center place that uh, historically has organized the uh, movement of resources and, uh, and, and that, that historic role um, really from, um, from pre-colonial times as a, as a, as a place of, um, of trade and as a place where, um, where people came together um, to meet and exchange. We know that uh, our city has um, has had a, a something of a transformation um, in terms of uh, becoming a more more of a post-industrial economy, more of a um, an economy centered around um, around the housing sector, and in fact, um, we have uh, we have a question in front of us whether we are too dependent on on that sector in the way that perhaps we were too dependent on resources in the past, natural resources in the past. So. There, 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 there are challenging questions um, going forward for the city of um, Vancouver and for, for our regional economy in terms of um, what kind of economy we want to have. And, uh, and one, of the, one, of the, one of the great challenges with uh, economies that are dependent on, uh, on a few or on a small number of sectors is that there's always that urge to try and build back um, in, in, in that sector or in those, in those sectors. So, so an important question for us going forward is what kind of diverse economy do we want to have and how do we, how do we want to have an economy that is, uh, that is inclusive at the same time? Um, a resilient economy isn't the same thing as building back what we had before. Um, uh, it's, it's more a question of the, the type of system we want to have. So um, that's a, that's a hopefully a useful way of um, starting to think about uh, about the kind of economy we want to have that is prosperous and resilient and sustainable. Um, our first uh, presenter this morning, um, Andy Yan, um, has um, really uh, um, been a leader in in thinking about what um, particularly the, the the impact of of the housing economy um, and the million dollar line have uh, have meant for our city. Um, uh, Andy Yan is the director of the city program at SFU, and he's um, going to speak for about 10 minutes um, uh, on, uh, on the shape of our economy. Over to you, Andy. Thank you so much, Peter. And good, good morning, everybody, as, um, well, begin to share my screen here, and hopefully we'll get this going. Um, sorry, a little technical difficulties. Okay, what happened here? Uh, okay screen and here we go and let me get this going i hope everyone can see my screen here and thank you so much uh peter for that uh, introduction uh i think today i'm here to really give you a couple of data points or at least references uh, a perspective if you will on vancouver's economy uh the good the bad and the ugly and i think that it's Andy, i'm just going to jump in to show that we can't see your screen oh you can't see my screen yeah okay, thank you. uh let me work on that right now uh huh okay Speaking of the good and the bad and the ugly. Okay, here we go. How's that? Perfect. We can see it. All right. Excellent. The good and the bad and the ugly. And um, I think from that perspective, I think it's important to understand our economy as one through which is a combination of formal and informal uh, activities that uh, very much when we think about our economy that it is, it is, I think, the idea of a combination of full time, part time and contract work, but then at the same time, I think the role of gig work as well as um, others as kind of survival income generation that it all, I think, comes together in thinking about the economy that makes the city of Vancouver and from the city of Vancouver, 
Vancouver. It's also, I think, understanding that it's a collect that the city itself has a collection of tool of tools that uh, they're 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 one of policy and regulation, uh, partnership and advocacy and investment. At that, it may not. The city itself may not be able to determine the winners of an urban economy, but can certainly create and facilitate the conditions for winning. And it's going into this kind of first question of what is the city of Vancouver? And I think from one perspective, at least from say the settler Vancouver perspective that the drivers of our economy at the, at the start of settler Vancouver can be seen in this original coat of arms for the city. Um, you could see the role of the port with the sailing ship, the role of resources in that tree in the middle and then the railway and how much that has shaped our city and, and, and and, 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 has, and has continued to shape our city and, and how much that has changed. But I think that within that change, I think it's critical to acknowledge uh, those who have been here time immemorial and that it's, it's how those relationships are established and are changing themselves that I think is important to note. I think that this image of the departure of the Coast and Interior Salish Chiefs delegation to, uh, to England in 1906, I think illustrate the role and the emerging role of the indigenous peoples of our, of this land and how the the idea of indigenous title has never been extinguished in British Columbia through which I think we are here today to I think talk about uh, the that the relationships that we have with the indigenous peoples of British Columbia and I think from that perspective we move forward to perhaps the view of who we are uh, today and I think that when we talk about our and planning. I think this image, I think, summarizes, I think, uh, what plan, what a lot of uh, development and and, and and economic development in Vancouver has looked like, uh, largely within the kind of downtown core. This is perhaps the image that has launched a million uh, planning careers. Or, uh, but then I think that it also I think illustrates a very particular time in Vancouver's development as a city. As we, we take a perspective of this city, of this of this city, and spin the camera around and and look at this city. That this is this same image of that city when you spin that camera around and look at the rest of the city of Vancouver. And I think that this puts an important context towards understanding really, well, what are the jobs in the city of Vancouver? And when we think about the jobs in the city of Vancouver and the type of industries uh, here, it's really a variety of jobs um, that um, indeed um, there isn't a single dominant majority sector, but that 50% of the jobs in the city of Vancouver are either in technical uh, technical and professional uh, management roles, it's in healthcare, it's in finance, insurance, and real estate, as well as in accommodations and food services, as well as a mix of other, uh, uh, other, other parts of the economy. And I think that it's within this idea of a fairly diverse sector, we actually see that the role and unfortunately data on the role of GDP and, and percentage of jobs is a bit difficult to get at that city basis. So this is around the regional basis is that we see that within uh, the, the region, we, we find that similarly, there is that type of diversity where there is no one single uh, sector that is dominant uh, in in, uh, in 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 the, in our region, that we look at the role of even uh, of well finance, insurance, and real estate. That eight percent of the of the of the employment um, sector is actually in that. But that fundamentally, when we look at how much it's generated in terms of our GDP, that that's actually a a sizable change. We find that at least within our regional economy, which I think is is reflected in in the in our local urban economy of the city of Vancouver, that uh, finance, insurance, and real estate makes up 31% of the GDP for the region. So I think that that I think brings some pretty interesting questions of what kinds of businesses and what kinds of industries can exist and thrive in the region and certainly in the city of Vancouver. But I think that it's also important to note how different 
the economy is experienced as this is of course just one perspective but that when we think about how jobs are distributed by something such as gender and you can certainly go through a number of other types of categories we see an unevenness uh, we find that eight almost 80 percent of healthcare and social assistance jobs in metropolitan vancouver are occupied by women uh, conversely uh, 87 percent of jobs in the construction industry are occupied by men and i think that this begins to understand that the economy is diverse and is experienced certainly in many different ways depending on who you are and i think that that's also then affiliated towards the role of incomes and talking about what are the incomes in the city of vancouver and when we think about incomes and household incomes in the city of vancouver which is one way of seeing incomes we see that we're a city of two we're, we're it's a tale of two cities that there is a city that is incredibly affluent as well as a city that is i think as 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 illustrated by 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 those who are homeless and i and that we are a city of a tale of two cities and with a median income of approximately sixty five thousand dollars but i think that it's also one that is dynamic and changing when we look at the role of what are the sectors in the city that are uh, that are uh, growing and i think that I, it's I, I should take a side note and 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 acknowledge the, uh, the the generosity, the data generosity of the city of Vancouver, as well as the Vancouver Economic Commission, that we look at how there are certain sectors of the economy that are thriving in terms of growth when we think about professional and professional and technical services and retail trade, but then we also see sectors that are that are shrinking in terms of the wholesale trade and manufacturing. And I think that an important uh, concept isn't just the number of jobs in any particular sector, but the quality of jobs. And the qual and I think quality can be measured in one way by income, by wages, that we see that some of the jobs that are fairly well paying are growing, but then we also have um, jobs that don't pay so well, uh, as we see the differences between technical services and, and retail trade. But then we also see the loss of jobs that were formerly well-paying in terms of manufacturing and transportation and warehousing as that changes in the city. And I think that it's also important to kind of put this in context to how we exist in as the rest of the region. And we see that really the role of the region, when we look at the top 10 large uh, largest regions in as urban regions in uh, Canada, and we look at those with bachelor degrees of working age, that out of the top 10, uh, metropolitan Vancouver, those living and working in metropolitan Vancouver is actually number nine, that we are, we have the ninth highest incomes uh, compared to really the rest of the country when it comes to income. So we're not necessarily a region of very high incomes in this uh, and, 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 and consequently a city of very high incomes in, in the overall view of the city, of the country's economy. And I think that the, some of these consequences I think can be seen in really those who can live or can stay, I think, in the city of Vancouver. We actually see, I think, the fact that uh, we, we, we may gain people in, at, from the ages of 13 to 32, but then at the same time, we lose people from, the late, from their late 30s to their early 50s. And also consequently, the, the children that really emerge during these life stages. And I think that this, I think, pronounced announces, I think, one of the ongoing challenges in terms of building an economy through which I think is inclusive and allows people to set roots. And I think that going into where the jobs are, it's understanding that 10% of the, the 10, that 50% of the jobs in Vancouver is on 10% of the land base. And that it's, of course, an environment through which the idea of employment lands are changing and industries are changing. But I think that within where the land is in terms of where our jobs are, it's also the fact that we are a city of hustle. The fact of the matter is, is that 75% of firms in the city of Vancouver are under 10 employees, that they are small. And I think 
think within that, that smallness, it does, while bringing in a certain level of agility, it also brings a certain level of vulnerability. And from that perspective, it's also where are workers coming from into the city of Vancouver. And I think the good news is that uh, over 50% of the uh, workers in the city of Vancouver live and work in the city of Vancouver, whereas 46% of the workers who uh, work in the city of Vancouver come from other municipalities outside the city of of Vancouver. And I think that that illustrates really some of the successes and ongoing challenges in terms of the connection of work and transportation and home. And from that perspective, it goes into really the factors of change. And I think within that factors of change, certainly the role of technology in terms of electrification, in terms of automation and digitization. But then also, I think some of these fundamental ideas of what drives change in the city. And certainly when we think about it, certainly the role of population growth and population change as we've certainly been a city since the 19, late, uh, late, late 1970s and early 1980s of of population growth and certainly that growth has I think illustrated and kind of culminated into the city that we see today but then also factors that perhaps uh, we don't necessarily have direct uh, control over but yet still affect us and I think that that's illustrated by not only the kind of population growth and growth in 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 our in the city's population and 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 housing and economy but then also in terms of population but then it's connection towards finance and the role of low interest rates and national policy that uh really shape us as a city and finally i think going into this discussion i think it's the idea that as we as we go and talk forward into the economy that it is really this need to assure that hope and Vancouver don't become two separate destinations that we are here today talking about Vancouver's economy. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, as always, for the really great um, summaries of data and, and providing those visuals. I think if everyone wasn't awake yet, hopefully you are now and really got to take in all of that information because I think um, it's, it'll be really helpful in grounding our conversation with the panelists shortly. So thanks, Andy. Thank you. Um, and before we dive into our panel, we have a few poll questions for everyone. Um, so Seth, if you could launch the first poll. Um, and the first question that we have is, what are the top three current economic concerns that the city of Vancouver should be trying to address? And you can pick up to three, and I'll give you a moment to read through them yourself. And if there's anything on that list that, or if you're not seeing something that feels important to you that isn't on that list, then you can feel free to, to write it in the chat as well. So the top three current economic concerns that the city of Vancouver should be trying to address. And we'll give you about 10 more seconds to pick your top three. And hey, Veronica, I just noticed that hosts and panelists can't vote. So this is this is going to be uh, audience only. Mm hmm. Okay, if you want to wrap up this poll, Seth. Okay, let's see what we have here. So it looks like the top, the top one is loss of small business and entrepreneurs, for sure. And the next one, disappearing in vulnerable arts and culture jobs and organizations. Um, and then we have a uh, tie for third place um, with supports for business and retail to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, um, as well as growing income and equity. Um, and we have a number of other ones. I'm seeing some also coming up in the chat as well. Um, a few comments around housing affordability in the chat, job space, um, growing the tech industry. Great. I think a lot of these um, specific um, concerns are ones that the panelists will also be speaking to as well. 
Um, so could we launch the second question? Um, and the second question is, which of the following are the top three areas the city needs to focus on to be ready to meet the needs of future residents and help the city prosper? And it's also multiple choice. So you can feel free to pick up to three. So the top three areas the city needs to focus on to be ready to meet the needs of future residents and help the city prosper. This is inviting everyone to think a little bit into the future. What do we need going forward? And once again, if you're not seeing something on this list, you can feel free to add it in the chat. And we'll give another 10 seconds or so. I know there's a lot of options to scroll through. Okay, and if we can close this chat or this poll and the results. Okay, so yeah, we have a few top answers. So the first one, innovative jobs and businesses to address climate change. So it sounds like climate change is coming up as one of the top priorities. Um, and then next we have entrepreneur friendly city used to set up and operate for not for profit and small businesses. And I think that connects well with the previous poll question of one of the top concerns being around the loss of small business and entrepreneurs. Um, and then we have sustainable transportation options for all trips and all needs. Um, and next we have a city of culture, arts and culture organizations and employers that are fundamental to the economy, which has certainly been hit really hard by the pandemic. And I think also was flagged as one of the top concerns in the in the previous poll. Um, so thanks for participating in the in the poll. And if that's kind of gotten you um, into um, thinking through some of the concerns that you have coming up and also some of your top priorities going forward, then there are some questions that reflect that in the Padlet. Um, so that's one way to participate while you're listening to, to the panelists as a reminder. Um, okay, so without further ado, we'll we'll move along uh, to our panelists. Great, thanks very much, Veronica. Uh, our first uh, speaker this morning is um, Chief Ian Campbell from the uh, Squamish Nation. Um, Chief Campbell, over to you. And I should just say that uh, we'll be pasting everybody's um, uh, bios uh, in the chat uh, as, we, as we invite them to speak. Thank you very much, Chief Ian. Yeah, fantastic, thanks, Peter. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's an honor to participate in this uh, webinar this morning. Uh, first of all, I want to thank my cousin Vanessa for her wonderful welcome this morning. It was amazing to hear my young relatives speaking our language so fluently. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, our organizers for putting this together. Um, I know you put a lot of work into making this happen during a time of COVID. And I hope you're all well and safe and your loved ones are doing well during this global pandemic. I uh, also want to acknowledge Gil Kelly. Uh, it's good to see you, Gil. And um, thank you for your opening comments as well uh, to see some of our uh, councillors from the city joining us today. It's, it's wonderful you could take the time to participate in this discussion. So, Nathan and Khalip Khushamin, my ancestral name is Khalip. And Khalip was one of the sons of Khatzlanuch, who you all know as Kitsilino. So my family lineage comes from the Khatzlanuch family. Uh, my chieftain name is Sokyo, and my chieftainship comes from the village of Kakulchan, which is uh, on the west side of Howe Sound, an area known as Port Mellon. Uh, I'm also a descendant of the Squamish and the Musqueam uh, peoples here in Vancouver. I come from the Campbell family in Musqueam and the Baker family in the Squamish Nation. 
So I have a very large uh, family with hundreds and hundreds of cousins. Uh, and I'm now serving my fourth term as an elected councillor of the Squamish Nation. Uh, I've been employed with the Squamish since 1999 uh, in the Intergovernmental Relations Department as one of our lead negotiators uh, in Aboriginal rights and title um, outside of treaties. So I'm going to speak mostly about um, that experience uh, as a negotiator and seeing um, affecting positive change through collaboration. Uh, I can't take credit for the work that uh, we've achieved recently. Uh, it's generations of effort. Um, in order to speak to future prosperity, I think it's important uh, that we look at the roadmap. And um, I appreciate uh, the, the opening introductions that recognize um, you know, these very complex dynamics between Indigenous and settler relations. Um, so, you know, we're, we're a young city in Vancouver, certainly um, the late 1800s was very dynamic with intermarriages uh, between settlers and our Indigenous women from the Musqueam and Squamish, notably uh, uh, Portuguese Joe uh, Silva uh, married uh, uh, Caltanot and, and um, we also have uh, Gassy Jack Dayton, who, who many of us see as, you know, the fathers of Vancouver who also married um, uh, Squamish women and, you know, and so forth. We have Navy Jack and others that married Slawia. And those, those interactions were very important as Hastings Mill was being established in Moodyville on the North Shore. Um, opening up access to resources was very important to have these strategic alliances through marriage with our chiefs, such as uh, the great chief Kapilano, known as Capilano. Um, we can even argue as far back as 1827 that, uh, you know, First Nations were the economy uh, with Fort Langley and other uh, stimulus in this, this part of the world. But as uh, settlers um, started, we've we seen an influx uh, into our territories. Uh, that dynamic quickly shifted. By 1900, we were forcibly removed from uh, the majority of our territory in what is now Vancouver. Uh, to make way for the CP rail and um, marginalization alienation under the, the Indian Act established in 1876 really became um, an agitation uh, to the, the relationships of, of participation in economy. Um, we were then relegated to our reserves, which comprise 0.3% of our territory. So less than 1% has been allocated to us under the federal government regime of the Indian Act. But uh, thankfully, my, my ancestors didn't look at the limitation of the reserves, and we still uh, have continued to question the, the legitimacy of the Crown to claim our territories, uh, you know, under the, the doctrine of discovery or terra nullius, acting as though this is a free and vacant land uh, open for the taking of, of newcomers to come and claim. Uh, much of our lands were preempted uh, prior to BC joining Confederation. Uh, in the 1860s, we had the, the Royal uh, Engineers surveying Vancouver, and much of it was already preempted under uh, a colony, a British colo uh, of the British colony, uh, without First Nations consent or uh, compensation. Uh, the image that was shown earlier uh, showed our chief's delegation in 1906 when we traveled to England to implore the Crown to seek honor in the Crown in these. Um, dynamics that we were seeing uh, mass depopulation due to pandemics that uh, ravaged our communities. Um, but, you know, it's important for us to learn this history that it's our collective history. It's not just an Indigenous experience. It's uh, a Canadian experience. It's a British Columbia and it's a Vancouver experience. So as we fast forward, you know, we weren't um, citizens in our own land until 1960. We didn't have the right to vote. We weren't considered Canadian citizens as, as Squamish, Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh people. Uh, but post-1960, um, much of the um, legislative oppression started to relax where uh, we can then attend post-secondary education. We can then hire lawyers to have legal recourse to protect our lands and our interests. Uh, and it was no longer illegal for us to gather and, and practice our culture uh, through ceremony and potlatch. Uh, this is simply my parents' generation that uh, we, we experienced this blatant racism, systemic racism. 
And now we're in an era of um, reconciliation, which is, it's good to see the narrative change, but we have to ask ourselves, what does that look like? What is reconciliation? action? And as we move forward to envision uh, a new future, uh, a, a prosperous future for, for all, um, it's important that we recognize also that much of the success we've gained as First Nations has not been out of moral goodwill by any level of government. Uh, it's been largely through court cases, through litigation, with well over 225 court cases at the Supreme Court of Canada that reframe relationships between Crown and First Nations. Uh, although I, I want to hold my hands in gratitude to the City of Vancouver, uh, for their proactive uh, approach to deem Vancouver a city of reconciliation. Um, I've been honored to, to work with many uh, successive uh, governments, both local, provincial and federal, uh, and build many uh, friendships amongst um, settler governments. And um, the, the work also must go to um, uh, recognize the shared territory of Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh, that this was divided uh, under the Indian Act, and that we have then reaffirmed our kinship ties uh, through protocol agreements that we then jointly uh, negotiate acquisitions of over 120 acres of land in Vancouver under fee simple uh, outside of the treaty process. So that's sort of my introduction of, of you know, where we came from and, and where we're going. Uh, in order to build that bright future, I wanted to uh, build some context into that. Uh, I've seen a one-minute sign, so I'm not sure uh, uh, how long you would like me to uh, to go on for. Thank you. Thank you, Halleck, Chief Campbell, um, for both providing, I think, really important colonial history um, on these lands um, and also providing what some of that future thinking can be and what some opportunities for us to be thinking about as we talk about the economy going forward. Um, and I think on that note of a uh, prosperous future, I think that's a really great segue to our next panelist um, who will be giving a bit of a, a perspective on, um, based on her perspective as a, a young organizer. Um, so next up we have Naya Lee, who is an organizer with the Sustainability Teens, a movement of youth in Metro Vancouver fighting for climate justice. Over to you, Naya. Thanks, Veronica and, and Chief Campbell as well. And thanks everyone. It's great to be here and to be in conversation with all of these other thoughtful panelists. In planning for Vancouver's next 30 years, there are a number of challenges facing young people, including an astronomically high cost of living, which is forcing us in droves to leave the city altogether. At the peak of job losses during COVID-19, for instance, nearly one in every three young workers was unemployed. At the same time, though, the climate crisis not only threatens our futures, but is creeping up on us through the air outside of our windows. It's difficult for most young people to think about the next 30 years because we know just how much change needs to happen in the next 10 for us to even have a livable city. That being said, we are seeing some solutions like Vancouver's recently passed Climate Emergency Action Plan, which meet the scale of the crises we're facing. In service to young people, a similar level of ambition should be applied to economic measures. I urge the city to go beyond what might be expected of it and to push the envelope on jurisdiction, support for other cities, and root its policy in processes, injustice, and equity. Seth Klein recommends that we address climate change through collaboration between the public and the private sectors, like during the Second World War. Recognizing and acting on the fact that the public sector can create jobs and generate wealth lays the foundations for a democratized economy, community governance, and more desperately needed high wage decent work for residents of Vancouver. Vancouver prides itself on being livable, green, and community oriented. But widening income inequality means that this city works best for those with a certain amount of money who are mainly not young and not from traditionally marginalized communities. In our recovery from COVID-19, as well as going forward, we can't maximize profits at the expense of our collective health and ability to thrive. We should be building an economy and a city which centers the realities of our host nations, of renters, BIPOC folks, the queer community and young people. 
establishing and prioritizing well-being as a metric of economic success is one way of ensuring that these communities are not left behind. This can be done through climate action. There's a risk of further exclusion and injustice if we don't take bold action on the climate crisis now. Specific climate solutions can center community too. Complete neighborhoods decrease transportation emissions and providing affordable and non-market housing goes hand in hand with zero carbon and retrofitted buildings. These are all changes we're going to have to make sooner rather than later. So it's imperative that they are equitable. Prioritizing well-being can also be more nuanced. Budgets reveal how committed cities are to the motions they've passed and the values they've mentioned. It's important that we recognize that historically excluded communities are the ones at the forefront of movements calling to defund the police and reinvest into public services, something that 77% of my generation also supports. Finally, centering well being in our economy means reconsidering who is involved in decision making in the first place. If and when we have to choose which sacrifices to make for climate or for the economy, Let's look to those who will be most impacted by those choices to direct us forward. Young people's uncertain economic reality mirrors our uncertain climate future. We know that we need to shift what we think is possible. Climate solutions show us that Vancouver's economic measures need to be disruptive in order to be truly transformative. Well-being should be prioritized as an indication of economic success and economic measures should be designed by the people most affected by them. We need to channel the vision and the drive of young people to expand our understanding of who the economy serves, which measures we can quote unquote realistically take, and what our futures can look like when we act boldly and collectively. Thank you. Thank you very much, Naya. That, that was just great. I mean, what, what's the city for if it's not for, uh, for the young people and, uh, and, uh, and our future? Um, I think uh, we're we're starting to at least I'm starting to get a sense of an emerging theme here around um, the connection between um, our social collective life and the and the economy. Um, I think that came through really strongly um, in uh, Chief Ian's presentation, talking about the the social basis of collaboration um, between the nations um, between nations and settlers. And so I'm really pleased uh, to introduce our next speaker, who's Michael Tan. And uh, Michael really embodies that uh, um, connection of, uh, of the social and the economic. He's the VP of Finance for uh, Damon Motors, a, a light electric vehicle manufacturer based in, in Vancouver, part of, part of our um, uh, green tech sector. And he's also the co-chair of the Chinatown Legacy Stewardship Group. Uh, welcome, Michael, over to you. Hey, everyone, good morning. Um, for the past 11 years, I'm gonna go straight into it. Um, for the past 11 years, I've uh, built and led finance teams for global scale companies in the tech industry, including Hootsuite, Unbounce, and now Damon Motors. Um, I've had a backstage pass to the rise of cloud computing and the digital economy and the impacts they're having on our, our world and city. I said backstage pass, not front row seat, because you know, as the finance guy, I get to see everything that happens behind the closed doors. Black Mirror has, I think, taught us how technology is changing our lives, but I think most people don't get just how profitable these tech companies are and what this profitability means for our cities. A quick accounting lesson, you know, gross profit is what you have left over after you pay for the labor and materials to produce the good or uh, service uh, you deliver. Um, in a restaurant, you know, that's the meat in your hamburger and paying someone to cook it, the literal minimum a business needs to get your money. But when you're selling cloud, digital goods, you know, like when SFU paid for the Zoom subscription we're on, Zoom incurred no additional labor materials costs, right? None. That's, you know, for that $10 of revenue, Zoom will incur a hosting cost of about 20 cents. Uh, that's a 98% uh, gross profit. It's an insane level of profitability. Uh, Amazon, uh, everyone orders, you know, their toilet paper and uh, uh, toothbrushes from them. The physical good stuff that they sell is 88% of their business, but accounts for 30% of their profit. Uh, Amazon Web Services, however, their cloud computing division is 12% of their business, accounts for 70% of their profit. These profit margins are what enables tech companies to spend like drunk trust fund kids on things like rent and high wages. Aha, Mike. Gotcha. You said they don't need to pay for labor, right? Well, 
And don't forget, tech companies still need to spend money on hiring developers to build that digital product. But once it's built, they can sell it an infinite number of times. You know, this profitability is not limited to companies like Amazon, Google, Facebook, who are all here in Vancouver, if you're not aware, and, you know, but also um, local companies as well. It enables them to pay these outrageous salaries you hear about um, in, you know, around the world. You, know, you have fresh undergrads here in Vancouver asking for $100,000 salaries and actually getting them. 10 years experience, I mean, you're even seeing crazier uh, salaries around 200 to 300,000. And that's not counting stock options either. Andy's slide earlier showing wages in the tech uh, at $28 an average. I was actually a little shocked how low it was. Um, tech companies not only throw money around on salaries, but you know, creating a, a high volume of jobs. Amazon announcing 6,000 jobs, Shopify 1,000 here, uh, thousands in a very short time horizon and thousands more coming. I believe there's folks here from the Vancouver Economic Commission and you know, their job is to create lots of good high paying jobs, mission accomplished, right? So what's the problem? These ultra high paying jobs are, you know, if you heard it, are exacerbating income inequality in a big way. So what happens when only the only homes private developers uh, are only building houses for families with $200,000 plus incomes? Um, I don't need to tell you how unaffordable Vancouver already is, uh, but these jobs with you know high volume jobs with a high paying salary is going to make things just that much worse. Um, you'll likely hear Charles from uh, the downtown BIA later talking about how restaurants cannot find wait and cook staff because those type of workers can't afford to live downtown. Um, you know I've heard of uh, de dentistry grads who are told not to set up in the west side because their dental assistants have to come in from Coquitlam. You're going to see a hollowing out of the character of Vancouver's neighborhoods because anyone who's not working in the tech industry, or is already a wealthy uh, through other means, they can only afford to live in the suburbs. You know, no more neighborhood restaurants, no more corner grocers. Your only choice will be Whole Foods, you know, who is in fact owned by Amazon again. Your, their grocery subsidized by the, by the profits from their cloud services. Uh, as Gil said earlier, small business is currently under stress, but it's going to get worse. Um, solutions, I, I don't think we can solve <laughs> income inequality, to be honest, that is a runaway freight train, but you can deal with housing affordability. I'm really excited about the SNOC uh, development, Indigenous development, uh, uh, and what those 6,000 homes will mean for Vancouver. I think we need more supply of housing, uh, but not necessarily from private developers who will only cater to the high end of market. CMHC was originally created to ensure Canadians coming back from World War II had affordable housing. I think rather than only achieving that goal through fiscal measures like mortgage insurance, um, you know, they actually need to play a more active role in, in housing and, and start to build homes for people. As for the city of Vancouver and the councillors in attendance, Gil Kelly and the rest of the staff, you know, that they need to use all the tools at their disposal to conserve character neighborhoods like Chinatown and Punjabi Market and everywhere else, or else we risk losing what makes Vancouver worthwhile to live in the first place. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Mike, for your for your insight and, and painting both a, a picture of some of the opportunities from the tech sector, but really some of the challenges that have been brought out. And I think you grounded that and connected it really nicely to your role in the um, on the Chinatown legacy stewardship group as well. Um, and next up, we have Johanna Lee, and Johanna is the manager of Embers East Side Works an income generation hub located um, on Vancouver's downtown east side. Over to you, Johanna. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna get t-shirts made that say you're on mute. I think that's gonna be a popular seller. Um, so yes, thank you for that uh, introduction, Veronica. I am Johanna Lee. I manage uh, Embers Eastside Works, a low barrier income generation hub located in Vancouver's downtown Eastside. I am coming to you from home today, which is on the uh, unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh. And I'm super grateful to be here today. I uh, want to thank all the organizers, hosts, panelists, and all of you that have joined us this morning. So as I reflect on some of the questions posed in the invite of this event, I can confidently say that after working for 14 years in the downtown east side, it's abundantly clear that words like prosperity, health, inclusive, and fair are not words I would use to describe the neighborhood. 
And like in many marginalized communities around the world, this has only been made worse by the COVID-19 pandemic. Now it was asking me what a just recovery will look like and how the downtown east side and vulnerable communities that struggle with homelessness, mental illness, and substance abuse can be supported in this recovery. I do see hope in this and believe there are opportunities that I call the silver linings of COVID, but only if we're truly committed. We use words like inclusivity all the time, but what does that really mean? Can emerging out of one of the biggest challenges of our generation lead to real change that ensures that no one continues to be left behind? We met in preparation for this event and we were posed a question. Who needs to give up what to make sure that it's fair for all? So of course, in keeping with the theme of this series, I believe the biggest thing we need to give up is the traditional ways we've done things in the past. From the biases we hold, the, how we view and value work, how we, how, and how people are allowed to participate in the economy. Now's the time for us to shed the narrow definitions of work, success, prosperity, and truly embrace what it means to be inclusive. In the work that I do managing a low barrier income generation hub in the downtown east side, we continually juggle using innovative methods to reintegrate individuals back to work that could never be considered for mainstream employment, while connecting people and organizations to better support the community, and most importantly, working on broader systems and policy change so that government mandated employment services are actually inclusive. For us to be successful, we need to change the definition of work. It can't be about full-time sustainable employment, and we need to banish the stigma that plagues many of the people we serve. We need to create jobs for vulnerable individuals that can work and that will work, but don't necessarily fit into our neat boxes of what employment looks like. We need to view vulnerable people in a holistic manner that recognizes their lives like everybody else's is interconnected, and so therefore must be their supports. We need to recognize the legitimacy of peer work and the informal economy as a source of suitable income and employment. We need to remove the barriers people face in accessing training and other employment services that don't fit exactly into the mold of the ideal client. And we need government and funders to recognize that we need to make a huge shift and to work together to support these innovations in an accountable but timely manner. We've seen during COVID that governments can move quickly if they want to. So why is it that a community that has been grappling with an emergency health crisis for years that has killed more people in this neighborhood than COVID waits so long for true reform and policy change? As said, because of COVID, I've been asked by senior leaders in government what we need to do moving forward. And we're happy to be at the table to provide answers and best practices. We can convene a province-wide network around low barrier employment to ensure that we're addressing this provincial issue with a truly provincial approach. But what needs to be, what, what we really need is the will and recognition that the system as it currently stands actively and very effectively excludes the most vulnerable from meaningfully partaking in the economy. And now is the time to make sure that long awaited change will finally occur. Thank you. Thanks very much, Joanna, and thanks so much for reminding us that uh, innovation uh, occurs both in the uh, in the public sector and in our and in our community and nonprofit sectors, as well as uh, as well as in the, uh, the the economic sectors narrowly defined. Um, our next panelist um, is uh, Charles Gauthier, who's the president and CEO of the uh, Downtown Vancouver Business Improvement Association. Um, over to you, Charles. Thanks, Peter. Um, as a business association, we care about what people's first impressions are of downtown Vancouver. Is it clean? Do you feel safe? Do you feel a sense of arrival in place? Do our streetscapes convey art, culture, and vibrancy? To that end, our core programs fall under four categories, placemaking, clean and safe, festivals and events, and economic development. We've been able to accomplish a lot of COVID-friendly programming under, under these departments in the past year, including storefront murals on boarded up shops, augmented reality activations with partnerships with the Vancouver Mural Festival, laneway transformations, art installations, and more. And we're currently working on ways to jumpstart the storefront economy and we'll also be working towards helping restaurant owners reestablish patio space for the coming patio season. I'd like to just go back though to the summer of 2015 when we partnered with SFU Public Square uh, to launch Reimagine Downtown Vancouver. We asked people who live, work and visit downtown to dream about the future. Over 11,000 people from all walks of life shared their visions for the future of downtown Vancouver. 
And this helped us develop a 25 year vision that is still shaping the work that we do as an organization across all of our programs. So what did people have to say? Well, they wanted a downtown that was a 24 mashup of community, commerce, creativity, and culture. And just to highlight that, you know, it's not just about the economy, it's about making, it, making downtown an interesting place to visit and live in. A place where nature and urbanism coexist in harmony. A connected city where digital technology is embraced. A downtown with a diverse mix of locals living in a variety of new housing options. A safe and friendly city with more public art and engagement. An architectural leader with a mix of old and new. A gathering place full of culture and art. An international business hub with unique shops and characters. And a place where everyone is welcome and wants to be. And just uh, last year, we launched a, uh, an exercise to re-envision uh, Granville Street. All of the things that helped shape the vision for downtown Vancouver have informed our strategy for Granville Street. Granville has been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic and needs to have its own cohesive strategy to help revitalize its many cultural spaces and restaurants. Fostering innovative developments like the one proposed for 800 Granville Street by Bonus Properties. And that's uh, for those of you that may not be familiar, that's the, the Commodore building. That's one way for us to help Granville Street regain its vitality. Uh, if this project were to go ahead, uh, it would uh, save four heritage buildings and it would provide uh, expanded new space for arts and culture. Uh, it would provide uh, a great opportunity for the Orpheum Theater to um, re-emphasize the stature of, the, of its um, box office on Granville Street. Many, many people who don't know it does exist as an entrance into the Orpheum Theater, most use Smite Street. Uh, although the pandemic has changed the way that office space will be used in the future, office space will still be necessary post COVID. There will be a need for space that allows employees to come together for collaboration, creativity and connection. And many of us have no doubt that uh, we'll embrace uh, a hybrid way of working going into the future. Uh, but as a reminder, over 4 million new square feet of office space is under construction right now. Uh, that will accommodate about 20,000 new jobs uh, that will be in the downtown core within the next few years. So we will need to have the physical space to accommodate these workers. The DVBI takes a leadership role in many aspects of downtown Vancouver's growth and innovation, but we can't do it alone. We need everyone's help. We need critical partnerships with groups like the City of Vancouver to get things done. One of the ways that the city plays a part is in allowing projects to go forward, even if just on a pilot basis. And I was really encouraged by Gil's uh, opening remarks today about action while planning. Um, I moved uh, to Vancouver uh, back in uh, 1992 um, because I thought, I believe, and I still believe that Vancouver is a leader, that uh, it is an urban laboratory and it needs to continue playing that role, hosting innovative and outside the box activations to see what works for our community. Uh, so my final uh, few words, it's let's be bold. Uh, let's not be boring. Thank you. Thanks Charles for that, that call to action. I think both in framing this conversation as we think going forward um, and also sharing a little bit more about um, the DBBIA's perspective. Um, next up, we have Caroline Hilton, um, and Caroline is the founder and chief executive officer of the Indigenom Indigenomics Institute, an Indigenous economic advisory for public governments, Indigenous communities, and the private sector. Caroline, I'll pass it off to you. Thank you. Uklasish Caroline Hilton, Heshwak Supsish Uklas Wakatush Kwatsa Omti. I come from New Channel Ancestry, and uh, thank you for the invitation to spend time with you today. Um, I wanted to acknowledge the leadership in bringing this conversation and this focus together today, and thank you for uh, Vanessa for the warm welcome and acknowledgement. Um, I wanted to be able to begin and really place this concept that we are influenced by our landscape. 
to be able to return to how in understanding our visual landscape and its influence of our decision making across time and how essentially our reality as a city is directly tied to our indigenous um, heritage of the development. I recently came across a picture of Granville Street in 1901 in its state of the initial logging of the old growth forest to establish what we know as Granville Street today. In the short time of now being 2021 to the realization of the emerging engine of Vancouver as a world-class city. What is important is that we retain our identity, our ties and our original relationship. I speak to a story of which is not mine, which refers to the Squamish reality. When we look to the mountains of the, what is referred to um, as the lion or the two sisters, it is in our landscape that reflects back to us the directives of the existing in our reality and in our relationship to our surroundings. It is in these directives that provide us the teachings of how to be. I encourage you in your planning to be able to tie the success of your outcomes to Indigenous reality and to Indigenous language because within that tells the values and provides the directions of how to be and how to be in relationship to each other. My work at the Indigenomics Institute is essentially about establishing the narrative of the foundation of Indigenous economic success. The core question that is in front of us is how do we plan for Indigenous economic success and inclusion? And while I note that the city itself has a social um, component to Indigenous planning, the notable absence of planning structures for Indigenous business and economic success is notable and significant to the importance of a 50-year outlook of the city of Vancouver. I note that in the evolution, and the same as my relative uh, Chief Ian Campbell, that the Indigenous population experience dis was disproportionately affected by the long-term evolution of the city of Vancouver itself. That is expressed in the socioeconomic relationship that we see every single day within this city. Indigenomics is essentially about modern, constructive, generative Indigenous economic design. It is being able to understand that economic design is fundamental to our relationship with Indigenous nations. That the balance within the larger country, within this province and within the city, the imbalance of the socioeconomic relationship is the place for economic reconciliation. The concept of reconciliation to me from an Indigenous perspective is essentially the requirement for that to occur within the balance sheet. To be able to understand, I've recently established the concept of a national tour of nations doing business at a billion dollar levels and above. My work at the Institute is focused on the emerging narrative and foundation of the potential of a national hundred billion dollar Indigenous economy. I encourage you as a city to establish the connection and the narrative of aligning to that economic target. In this concept of the tour of 10 nations doing business at a hundred at a billion dollar level and above, in the first 10 that I identified, Squamish Nation was identified within that twice. What becomes important to that is to be able to understand the significant shift that we are looking at, the economic inclusion of Indigenous peoples. I ask you to consider, do you actually know how many Indigenous businesses there are within the city or within the larger region? Do you have an Indigenous procurement policy? To be able to understand and to be, a, to be able to establish clear pathways of whether that's existing structures, such as within the Chamber of Commerce for pathways of inclusion and visibility of Indigenous businesses. 
to understand that in nations that are doing um, billion dollar levels of indigenous economic activity, that in the first 10 that we identified, Squamish was identified within that twice. I started that tour within October and now within the end of February, we're actually up to over 14. My work at the Institute is driving a narrative that Indigenous peoples are economic powerhouses. What we see within the social symptoms within this city is not fully indicative of economic loss of power, but instead the realization of the lack of balance between the economic and social relationship. What is important to me to be able to relay within the concept of a future pacing Vancouver's economic um, outcomes in a long-term outlook is valuing the Indigenous economic relationship to be able to build and make decisions from the place that Indigenous peoples are economic powerhouses. I operate from the construct that the questions we ask today are the architecture of tomorrow. If we are building our tomorrow, what questions are we asking today? I ask you specifically, how does Vancouver get ready for the emerging $100 billion national Indigenous economy? What data do you need to support? What economic tools and pathways support Indigenous economic inclusion? To be able to breathe vitality into the Indigenous economic and social relationship is the task today. The fundamental equation of this country is an overbalance on the social symptoms of the Indigenous experience in the development of Canada itself. When we can shift towards being able to facilitate from the balance of the socioeconomic relationship, that is what success will look like within a 50 year time frame. I encourage you to be able to bring into visibility procurement as an economic enabler within your Indigenous relationship. To be able to look at your structures of business for economic inclusion of Indigenous businesses, such as through the Chamber of Commerce. We're seeing examples across this country of chambers beginning to be able to establish new means of engaging and bringing visibility to Indigenous businesses. To understand and be able to build data around Indigenous economic outcome supports and facilitates a positive equation of Indigenous economic inclusion. My work at the Indigenomics Institute is fundamentally an invitation into the concept of Indigenomics as a place to equalize the disproportionate impacts of Indigenous economic exclusion, both in the development of this city in the development of this province and nationally. The concept of Indigenomics is essentially an invitation. It's an invitation into who wants to construct pathways for positive Indigenous economic growth. It's an invitation into the idea of being able to facilitate economic relationships as a platform for modern constructive Indigenous economic design. As long as the imbalance between the socio and economic relationship and the pathways of which we facilitate those um, actions are, have an overbalance on the social, it is now time to be able to balance our perspective and establish positive means for Indigenous economic inclusion. Thank you for the time to be able to um, spend with you today and my last uh, question is who wants to play Indigenomics? Thank you. Thanks very much, Carol Ann. Um, and, and thanks also for, uh, for um, uh, turning, turning the conversation uh, um, uh, from, um, from, uh, from what, we, uh, what we look at in terms of our economic indicators um, uh, and, and sort of rethinking um, some of the ways in which we measure and, uh, and report on um, what we regard as progress. So thank you for that. Our last panelist um, is um, Julia, Julia Aoki. She um, joins us as the executive director of Megaphone, um, which is uh, the newspaper that you can purchase all over Vancouver. Over to you, Julia. Thank you. I'm going to just jump right in. 
Um, I've been asked to prepare something on the arts and a healthy economy in Vancouver, and my opinions on the subject, which are entirely my own, are formed from experiences working in various capacities in small arts and cultural nonprofits, all of which have had strong social justice or accessibility mandates and ambitions. It feels important to situate myself because I'm not an artist, uh, I'm not a curator or art historian, and I think it'll be very important to hear from practitioners as you go forward with this process, in particular those who are struggling to live and maintain a practice in Vancouver. As with any area of planning, it's crucial to bring those who have the least agency, the least financial, social, or political capital to the table, because when you're making plans for the city, you're in many ways deciding their fate. Vancouver has the highest concentration of working artists of all the major cities in Canada, according to an analysis of 2016 census data by Hills Strategies. That includes over 8,800 artists and over 35,000 cultural workers. In that same year, the income gap between the average artist and the average worker in Vancouver was 37%. The median personal income for artists was $27,000. Uh, and that was the uh, most recent study that they did on that, but uh, they did do a study recently showing that something like 50% of cultural workers uh, lost their jobs during COVID. So I'm sure you can imagine that making so little in a city as expensive as Vancouver means that this is a community that is incredibly vulnerable to forced displacement through property speculation. And um, I don't have data on that, but anecdotally, in my experience, a migration out of the city for those who have that option is well underway. Add to that, uh, an artist's very livelihood often requires dedicated studio space, which is also made vulnerable to speculation. Eastside Culture Crawl produced a study of studio displacements in 2019. They say that the median rental rate of studio space has increased by 65% over the preceding eight years, while visual artists remain among the most economically undercompensated job category. They also demonstrated that 400,000 square feet of studio space was lost over the 10 years prior to publication as a result of residential or commercial conversions and redevelopment. So what is lost in that displacement for the community at large? There are studies that demonstrate a strong relationship between participation in the arts and overall health, both physical and mental. I think this is a really compelling framing for policy. Although if there is a causal relationship between health and participation in the arts, it's likely that good health makes arts accessible. And there needs to be a conversation around making accessible arts, therefore. There are also arguments that a healthy art sector has positive economic impacts. I will let someone else make that argument as I personally loathe the framing, particularly in a prescriptive uh, conversation or planning conversation. I think there is very good reason for even imperfectly guarding artistic and cultural practices from political and economic mechanisms wherever possible. And we shouldn't be instrumentalizing the arts towards economic growth that risks further displacement and class disparity. So what I personally agonize over uh, when uh, I know that people are fleeing the city, organizations are struggling, uh, is the loss of locally grounded critical conversations and progressive experiments in organizational and social relationships. And this is the thing that brings me anxiety when I see another condo tower go up near affordable rental stock that I know houses a high concentration of artists and artist studios. Our arts communities and organizations are creating space for experiments in power and knowledge sharing, redistribution of resources, non-hierarchical decision-making practices, and critical self-reflection and accountability. In my experience, artworks, practices, and discursive material that emerge from the context of small organizations and collectives are deeply rooted in locally situated relationships. Uh, they are porous spaces um, that where communities can convene. There's often, there are often spaces for experiments in thought and practice with robust educational and outreach programming, as well as in, they're often repositories for very unique Vancouver histories. And all of this has impacts far beyond any individual artist or artwork. 
So this would be my preferred framing for evaluating local impact of the arts from a planning perspective. What, it, what existing and emergent relationships are made possible through arts and cultural practices, and specifically those that the city spending priorities will support. If those relationships are primarily to mobile capital, land and property value, uh, and in my opinion, an international art market or even the tourism industry, then we're not doing the work of building a livable city for its residents. In fact, we're doing the opposite. There's a, there's a very good reason that our major funders have an arm's length model, which again operates imperfectly, but nonetheless, there's an understood value to that approach. I personally don't want to live in a city that succumbs to the whims of a developer's notions of what is marketable, approachable, or self-valorizing art, while artists making work that is grounded in community or advancing critical conversations are being squeezed out of their city. Thanks, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Julia, for, I think, expanding our notion of what it means for us to have um, a su successful economy. And I think also what's at stake if we continue to or, or, or lose a large um, number of the artists who currently reside here. Um, and I think I'll invite all of our panelists to turn your videos on. Great. Um, and I think the first thing, we have a number of questions that have come in through the, the Q&A, but first we wanted to give you all an opportunity, if there's something that you heard from someone else that you wanted to specifically respond to or, or build on. So opening that up to, to any of our panelists. Okay, I think we have a, a polite crew. I think there are a lot of invitations to to um, to be bold, um, and so I'll also invite all of the the, the panelists to also um, jump in if you'd like to at any point. Um, but we can move to to our first question, um, and the first question um, I think is initially directed at um, Chief Campbell. But um, if anybody else would like to to jump in too. Um, the question is, what are the opportunities and challenges that you see going forward regarding the major economic development initiatives being led by Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and other Indigenous peoples and nations? And I think you began yeah. to touch on that in your remarks, but do you have anything to add? Awesome, thank you. Yeah, great question. So I'm really excited about the collaboration between the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh in jointly acquiring about 120 acres of fee simple lands uh, that are going through rezoning uh, with the city. Um, these lands were acquired from the province and the federal governments. Uh, and, um, you know, we're looking at mixed use, primarily rental, a, a lot of rental, affordable rental, uh, social housing, uh, as well as um, market housing in order to pay for some of the phasing. Um, of course, we're looking at transportation as well. And, um, you know, how, how, to recognize we're not in silos that uh, this is a part of the entire metro vancouver uh dynamic on um you know creating retail space commercial space uh light industrial uh, on some of the pro properties that are conducive for that so um we definitely want to be a part of the solution around uh you know phasing there's a lot of procurement opportunities a lot of careers that can be forged from uh, these properties and then there's the on reserve um snock development in false creek which is about 10.68 acres uh, finally reclaimed after 2000 uh, in 2003 after being in court since 1977 but those partnerships you know uh, going out to developers and creating um, a brand um you know visibility we've been invisible in our own land for far too long uh, so we, we definitely want to showcase that our history is your history that uh, as as Carol Ann mentioned this land is laden with mythology and, and history that we want to showcase and celebrate. So as we build that into the ambiance, the naming, the recognition, um, you know, of these projects, uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg. You know, we, we see this as a major economic generator for the nations to generate important revenues, uh, not dependent on federal government transfer dollars, uh, but to create own source revenue and, and stimulate economy for the region. Thank you.
maybe I'll just jump in. I, I just want to comment uh, on, 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 on the synoptic de development. And I mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, I, you know, when I first heard about, you know, 6,000 homes coming online, you know, at the foot of the Broad Street Bridge uh, on Squamish land, you know, I think that is, you know, one of the most exciting things I've, I've heard coming out um, that's been announced uh, in recent years um, in terms of housing. Uh, and, you know, what, what really intrigued me about it was also that there was a, there was, because it was on, you know, uh, Indigenous land, it wasn't beholden to the City of Vancouver uh, regulations around for every so many units of uh, housing, you have to build parking. Um, you know, I, and I think that's uh, really uh, exciting and an exciting opportunity. I think there's going to be challenges. Um, you know, I, I think I was chatting with Andy before about how that there's going to be, or he, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but, you know, because of the lack of transit infrastructure, right? How do we support 6,000, um, you know, families in that area properly? You know, that's, it's not just going to be there. It's a, you know, it's across the city, uh, but at least, um, you know, I think that's, that that's leadership in terms of when we're looking at cities, provincial and, and federal governments, you know, looking to how do we invest in building non-private housing? I mean, this is private housing still, uh, I would say, um, you know, indigenous uh, led, of course, but um, it, it, we can't just have, you know, private developers, you know, swallowing up all the profits of, um, you know, developing high end uh, housing. One of the themes that's come up uh, in in several of the presentations, um, and uh, and I think there's there's been some of it in the in the chat as well, is around the the role of the downtown area, um, and uh, we we do have a um, an interesting situation in Vancouver where where the downtown is 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 both a, a place of social need as well as um, a gateway and an important part of the um, the city's kind of overall positioning. Um, and, and uh, presentation to the rest of the world. Um, maybe maybe I'll ask Charles to to kick off here, and then uh, and then see if others see how others want to pick up on this. It seems to me there's a, there's a, a possibility of the downtown being viewed with some suspicion as we emerge from from the pandemic. Um, if its if its role is as a place where people meet and mix, and where um, where surprising um, encounters happen. Um, uh, at least in part, the pandemic has lost some of that for us. Um, and so how are we going to rebuild faith and, um, and trust in the downtown um, and, uh, and make sure that, um, that that's done in a way that ends up more inclusive rather than less inclusive? Um, Great question, Peter. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I'm quite confident that... Um, you know, well, I mean, people will come back. Um, you know, we're going to start to re-engage. I, I know that we have, um, we've heard from a lot of people that, uh, you know, they want to come back to the workplace. Uh, we know that we're all craving, um, you know, that social interaction uh, that we've had uh, prior to the pandemic with uh, strangers and with friends. And, um, you know, we're all craving the opportunity to get back and to go uh, to a live performance, a live theater performance or live concerts. Uh, but I think you're right. I think we need to, you know, there's been a lot of, um, you know, I don't want to use the word hate. It's, I think it's a bit too strong, but there's a lot of distrust. Um, you know, certainly we've seen an increase in, um, you know, individuals uh, living uh, on the streets, the homeless population and people that are uh, dealing with uh, substance abuse issues. And it is certainly more visible when we're not seeing hundreds of thousands of people in the downtown area, but I'm kind of hoping that we'll emerge from this um, much more compassionate and, uh, you know, maybe doubling down on our efforts uh, to help those people. Our organization, um, you know, and it's taken us a long time, I'll be the first to admit, uh, but I think we've taken some bold steps in supporting initiatives like Safe Drug Supply, you know, being on the front line of supporting the uh, uh, the overdose prevention site that's going to open at Seymour and Helmkin uh, very soon, and um, other initiatives, right, to start to address those um, those social issues that have been with us for a very long time. Uh, so, as I think some of you know, I mean, I'm stepping out of this role at the end of June after uh, slightly over 29 years here. Uh, my hope is that the organization, uh, and I have every confidence it will, uh, will continue to be 
um, supportive of social issues and uh, being a strong advocate for those and, and working in partnership uh, with organizations that are trying to make a difference for those people that are having a difficult time. So I, uh, all I can do is hope uh, as a citizen, um, I'm gonna do my part uh, and stay engaged uh, in some way. I do live in the city, uh, but it's going to be my successor and, and the organization um, that, you know, hopefully you can all keep uh, their feet to the fire and ensure that they continue the work that, um, you know, that I had the uh, privilege of starting off here um, uh, about five, 10 years ago. I hope that's somewhat of an answer to your question, uh, but I, I do think it's gonna be, you know, there is a steep curve here in terms of the economic recovery. Um, we're not, um, we're not naive to think that it's going to happen overnight. Uh, and I think we just, as I said in my comments, we're all gonna need to work together uh, to, to come out of this. Um, hopefully it will be a new normal, it will be different, um, but uh, I'm confident that downtown will rebound, but it will be different. And maybe turning to some of the other panelists, what are the ways that the downtown as a part of our city might be different, might be more resilient, might be more sustainable? I, I was just I was just going to comment on you know I, I think that good job an amazing job I think Charles and downtown BIA and you know also with the city has been in creating um, you know even in the pandemic public spaces kind of and you know taking advantage of you know a lot of the public plazas I know at the Vancouver Art Gallery and um, close to where I live the um, on Butte and uh, and Robson there's you know these you know, public seating areas for people to socially distant. Um, uh, socially distantly and um, uh, socialize, right? And, and to gather a little bit, um, you know, I, but I think what has really highlighted um, during the pandemic is that uh, highlighted the need for not just public spaces, but actually covered spaces. You know, Vancouver's a rainy, cold city, you know, 10 months of the year, um, and it's, there's nowhere to go outdoors um in in that covered area you know that has been really highlighted for me you know going through uh the the park redesign process in, in northeast falls creek as uh, gil kelly knows um about uh, you know we're, we're trying to you know, we're, we're talking about building a, a covered uh, parkways um and you know it, it's been difficult but uh, i think that's going to be what hopefully is changing as uh, in terms of uh, the, the planning process when thinking about developing these plazas in the future uh, if I can just jump into, um, Charles, I think your BIA is doing actually a great job in partnering with um, other agencies to actually in ensure that we're moving forward in a good way. So even this summer, um, you guys hired uh, people uh, that we employed at Eastside Works for the Perch Stewardship uh, Program, which was great in the middle of a pandemic. And I know how much uh, your team must have been trying to support local businesses as you do but remembering um, the most vulnerable that need the employment. I really think like you say, coming out of this with more compassion, I, I know there's a lot of backlash right now. Um, the downtown east side seems to have spilled into Chinatown, into Strathcona. There is uh, more crime, more violence because people are truly just more desperate. Like I say, I've been down there for almost 15 years. It's only actually gotten worse. I've never actually felt unsafe in the downtown east side. And for the first time this last spring, the beginning of the pandemic I actually did. I think we really need to come out of this uh, unified together to recognize that we can no longer ignore these things. I, I think we, we, we've done it as a society, done a very good job of just pretending that it can stay in the downtown east side and just those homeless people and they aren't part of the society. And I think now we have to really look at how we emerge from this together jointly. I think there are, are many, the partnerships and the collaboration is the way out of this. And if we can come out of this with the compassion and understanding and the innovations that I know that we all collectively share, I think we can use this as an opportunity to emerge from this better than when we went in, which is my hope. Yeah, I'll just give a pithy one line response, which is we need houses. We need housing yesterday. Um, but I'll also add to that in terms of safe supply, like the, it, you know, there have been some some really good uh, shifts there. There's been some progress made, but it's still not completely accessible. So, yeah, I, I agree with Johanna. There needs to be um, more momentum, more collaboration, more consensus around this, and just it just needs to be done. 
Yeah, I would just quickly add to that as well. I mean, I think just reiterating, like we know how much COVID has taught us how interconnected we are and, and also how much is possible on a government level when the government is properly recognizing the crises that we're in, including like drug poisoning crisis and housing crisis and, and climate crisis as well and how much is, is possible when we're really widening the, the window of, of, of what is possible to, to meet those crises and to take action at them at the level that we, we know and communities know that we need. Yeah, and I think that that ties really nicely into another question that we had. Um, I think a, a big theme that came up in, in all of the panelists' remarks was, what does a successful economy actually look like? How do we evaluate that it's healthy, that it's resilient, that it's just, that it's centering equity? Um, and I think each of you touched on it in a different way. I think um, uh, Johanna tying in um, the opportunity for fair work and recognizing the legitimacy of, um, of the informal sector. Um, Carol Ann tying success of outcomes to in ind indigenous reality. Um, and Julia, the presence and support for artists and, um, and cultural workers in our city. And I think each of you also shared different examples. Um, and one of the questions that we had in the Q&A um, from Alice was how is Vancouver incorporating um, measures other than the GDP to evaluate how the economy is actually serving our communities and our environment? Um, and I think we have Meg O'Shea from the Vancouver Economic Commission who wanted to jump in and address that live. And then I think I wanted to bounce that question back to all of the panelists again of how do we know and how do we measure and evaluate that our economy is healthy? Thanks, Veronica. Yeah, hi, everybody. I am the manager of small to medium businesses at the Vancouver Economic Commission. Uh, and actually, I was just hoping that the question would be posed to panelists. So I will pass it back to you after saying that the Vancouver Economic Commission and City of Vancouver are working really, uh, you know, really diligently and creatively on this question during the Vancouver plan process, that we're trying to identify what makes a healthy and diverse economy, what, what does that feel like, and how is it experienced by everybody in 2050, everybody, uh, and then, of course, what are the indicators that we need to track progress on and, and work against going forward between now and then, so flipping it back to the panelists, um, what, what are the other than GDP or the beyond GDP metrics and indicators that you would um, advocate for as top measures of economic well-being, I'd, I'd love to hear first from Carol Ann if I can direct it. Thanks. Uh, thank you. I've recently undertaken some work that was shaping a narrative around money, meaning, and metrics in the emerging Indigenous economy. And what has been important to me in that is uh, shaping the establishment of a new, co new tool called the Indigenomics Economic Freedom Index. So looking at the correlation between our fiscal relationship, um, own source revenue, and investability. And I think engaging in this concept of constructive generative economic design um, is essential within this existing current um, city's relationship to be able to positively impact its future. Um, I'm very much uh, indigenous concepts of economy are multi-generational and not by existing mandates or time constraints within those cycles, but more from a multi-generational uh, perspective. So the, while there's all kinds of work happening around alternatives to GDP, establishing well-being, uh, budgeting, the tools are there. I think it's the ability to step outside of the comfort zone of existing um, metrics of GDP and look at those as the ability to facilitate um, the utilization of tools or alternative um, ways that support innovation um, and demonstrate um, the activate activation of our ability to be innovative in our relationships, in our design, and in our planning. And that's really, I see, at the core of what resiliency means. Thank you. If you'd like to uh, follow, um, yeah, Chief Ian. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, highlight that uh, BC Assembly of First Nations recently commissioned a report uh, 
done by Mark uh, Podlasli on the um, uh, economic development and, and well-being uh, index to, to really present that to the province of BC uh, in contrast to GDP measurements that um, GDP coming about, uh, you know, almost 100 years ago in, in the 30s from the Great Depression, uh, really, you know, we need to mature as a society and continue to look at the gaps within those uh, metrics and look at wellness. Uh, you know, we look at, you know, this this last couple of years alone with the um, increase in uh, opioid fatalities and uh, addictions, uh, that wellness index, I think, is really important as a society that we continue to look at the triple bottom line of not just economic growth, but um, sustainability around the Salish Sea, extirpation of our resident orcas, the collapse of our salmon fisheries, uh, you know, the gold rush mentality that, that has been experienced since the arrival of um, settlers uh, has continued to perpetuate to this day with, um, you know, the forest deforestation, uh, now oil, gas and mining, along with uh, uh, land, real estate. So, you know, looking at sustainability within those uh, economies, I think is really important to also recognize that Vancouver is a gateway, that we do need to create an economy, but um, at what expense? So, you know, we look at transboundary issues as Coast Salish between the Canada-US tribes and the health of the Salish Sea. Uh, you know, we supported LNG through our own independent assessment where we issued 25 legally binding conditions to the proponents in contrast to Trans Mountain, which we were uh, treated as stakeholders. So I think there's a lot of um, uh, dialogue that needs to continue to address GDP and who it benefits and, and who is marginalized as a result of uh, this type of um, uh, regime. So I, I invite you to look at the BCAFN website uh, for their, uh, their recent report on wellness. Thank you. Veronica, Peter, I could just add uh, my thoughts. Um, I think I often get um, characterized because I represent a business organization that I'm going to come at it from a business perspective. And then that's really not my, um, my field, so to speak. Um, I'm really, from my background, you know, my, I have a master in city planning and, uh, and I'm, I'm really interested in those social interactions and uh, how cities work in the built form, of course. But um, the one thing I would I would uh, encourage you to look at is that it's it's four years ago, but the Vancouver Foundation did uh, some work research on how connected are we uh, in Metro Vancouver, like how well do we know our neighbors, and you know how engaged are we in our community. Um, I think that's an indicator I, I would look to, um, you know, not just the GDP, but you know how are we doing in terms of. Uh, of uh, neighborliness and uh, being engaged in in our community and being active, um, you know, in in civic um, in civic opportunities like the one you're doing today. So uh, I would I would stress that, um, not more so, but in addition to the GDP. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that uh, we we're starting to uh, um, get towards the end of our time. There are a lot of great questions coming through the chat when, and I do know that the city will be um, taking note of them. Um, one theme that I think is very interesting um, in the chat is around the question of um, public social infrastructure. There's been some very uh, important questions about schools. And, uh, and of course, we, we're all aware in this city about the role of housing and, uh, and, and, and some of the ways that housing is a deterrent to, um, to young families, but I, I think we also should be thinking about our public infrastructure in the same kinds of ways um, as, uh, as part of the ways that, um, that planning efforts can, um, if, not, um, if not counteract, they can at least ameliorate some of the effects of inequality, which is another theme that, uh, that people have been putting in the chat and our panelists have picked up on. Um, I don't know, um, uh, Gil, would you like to speak at this point? Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, thank Welcome. you, Peter. That'd be all right. I, I just wanted to add a perspective that might tie some of this together. This has been a great panel, by the way, and a lot of um, themes and opinions have come out and, and frank, frankly, urgent calls for needs of rethinking how we do economic development have come out of just this conversation today between the panelists uh, and the attendees. I just wanted to add maybe one perspective, um, which may seem a, a little bit obvious, but I think it needs calling out, which is um, uh, we have a role collectively here between the city 
uh, partnerships, including the universities, business, nonprofits, um, and so forth, to shape the economy. And that's a little bit um, at odds with traditional economic development planning that most cities in North America have um, have embraced. Uh, and that version goes something like this. The economy is dynamic uh, and will take care of itself, will evolve over time. And actually government should just mostly get out of the way except to lower taxes and speed up permitting. And therefore uh, the driving force amongst many cities is to chase after employers and corporations who will land there for at least some time while they abate taxes and so forth. And then the city hopes for the best. Um, in my view, that has not worked well. Uh, it's worked very occasionally in a few cities only and for a limited period of time. Um, the other uh, version is, which I think we're getting into today, is the economy is really about people. It's about people who are here. And that's the starting point. And while um, having innovation uh, through the uh, private sector, uh, attracting capital, attracting talent, growing local talent are all important things um, for sure. Um, I think we have to start with the notion of what is a holistic economy that serves all of us going forward into the future. And that's a very different starting point. And I think that's what we're hearing today. And so, you know, I've been doing economic development my whole career as part of my urban planning uh, role in, in a number of cities. I, I sort of devised, along with my economic development staff some years ago, a very simple way of thinking about what does the private sector do versus the public and nonprofit sector do. And the private sector uh, really does primarily bring capital and investment. Um, it brings innovation, and that goes from small business to even large, larger businesses. Uh, they're not solely responsible for innovation. The public and nonprofit sectors do that too, but, but I think it's a huge uh, uh, benefit driving driving change, uh, good and bad. Um, and they also, um, uh, you know, uh, employ people, right? There's no, no question about that. And, and on the best days, they can partner with other agencies to advance social causes. The public sector's role, and I'm speaking here not simply about the city government, but about um, schools, colleges, universities, uh, and nonprofits, um, is really, uh, if you boil it down, if the private sector is around uh, labor, excuse me, around um, uh, capital and innovation and talent, the public side of the equation and nonprofit side is really about three things, land, labor, and infrastructure. Those are critical economic inputs. When land, I mean not just publicly owned land, of course, but our ability to regulate the use of land. So for example, 10 years ago, we, we reserved a whole bunch of the downtown for employment and not for condominium uh, towers, which basically were going to under, override any ability to provide jobs downtown uh, in the future. In, in my tenure here, we uh, revisited the False Creek Flats and reserved that space for light industry and for artists and, and um, uh, to some extent food, uh, food production and so forth. Um, without, again, turning the lever to say highest and best use for condominiums. Um, so the land piece is important. By labor, I mean not literally providing people for jobs, although the public and nonprofit do some of that, but really to all the supports that go into having a sustainable long-term labor force here. That means affordable housing. It means community services and schools and neighborhoods, all of that range of things that actually supply workers reliably and consistently to employers, right? Um, and the infrastructure piece is of course may be obvious, which is, um, but it requires strategic thinking about what kinds of investments in infrastructure we make. It's not simply water and sewer. What about um, a high-speed internet? Uh, what about transportation to get people back and forth reliably? So I think when we know the power of the other side of the equation to shape an economy, all of the conversations today really come into play. We actually, we do have a toolkit. Now our job I think is to harness that in the ways that Carol Ann was talking about uh, and for, for artists um, to embrace the First Nations um, uh, power in, um, in, in actually investing and developing and rethinking and partnering. Uh, we have one which people uh, mentioned in the Sanak development that is on reserve. Most of the rest of the immediate economic activity for host nations is, is on MST lands, um, 
which have been turned over from the federal government and are actually under city jurisdiction legally. So what does the partnership look like there to reinvent the economy? What, what is the shape of revitalizing, revitalizing the downtown? Uh, we have a lot to say about that, not only through the public realm exercise that, um, that was mentioned um, earlier by Michael Tan and by Charles, uh, which is a key part of making a lively downtown, but also in taking care of, of those in the downtown east side, um, as was mentioned, that's a, that's a role that both business and government and nonprofits need to play together um, so that we're not sort of shunting off to the side that sort of problematic aspects, if you will, uh, of, of future development. And so I think this is a great conversation that allows us to be much more proactive under a new kind of paradigm than cities have typically chased in the, in the modern era. There was a comment around the post forwardist <laughs> solutions. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm just very heartened by this conversation. So thank you, Peter. Thanks, Gil. Thanks, Veronica, Lynn. I think we're, we've reached time. Yeah, we have. I think we also really wanted to make sure that we ended um, with the panelists having the final word. So I know we're at time, but so if you have to leave, we, we understand. Um, but we just wanted to make sure that the panelists could have a final word. So if each of you could maybe share your final thoughts, maybe in, in response to Gil's comments and, and back in response to the core question of today's conversation. Um, and maybe if you could try to summarize your thoughts in a sentence or two, so we can try to finish as close to time as we can. Um, would anybody like to start us off? Maybe we can go in order that we started with. Oh, and I see you unmuted yourself as well, Chief Campbell, thank you. Yeah, awesome. I just really wanna thank the uh, organizers. I think this has been a, a great uh, discussion this morning and really pleased to hear the varied thoughts and opinions on, on our, our vision. And, um, you know, just my final comment really is just that we're not assimilated people as MST. Uh, we have our own values, we have our own laws, we have our own uh, epistemologies of ways of knowing and doing. And uh, to integrate, you know, doesn't mean First Nations are always going to cross the line and, uh, you know, assimilate ourselves into uh, mainstream society, uh, there's there's a reciprocation that we add value to the, to the solution. And that's what I see with the city of Vancouver is a tremendous opportunity to showcase to the world how to reframe relationships. Uh, we're seeing this in Aotearoa, in New Zealand, uh, with other indigenous groups elsewhere as we move into a post-colonial era. Uh, we ask ourselves, what does that look like in drawing from uh, our values, which have spanned this part of the world for millennia uh, and have stood the test of time. And as we incorporate that into Western regimes, uh, along with Indigenous regimes, I think the possibility and potential uh, is very exciting for us to celebrate a new era uh, together, which, uh, you know, the last hundred years demonstrates how not to do things. <laughs> uh, we hope to uh, be a part of the solution. So uh, I appreciate Gil's comments and everyone else from the city and, and look forward to continue to work together. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Campbell. Naya, we'll go to you next. Yeah, for sure. I think I shared some of my thoughts on, on what Gil shared uh, in the chat, but I just want to return quickly to, to the idea of measuring economic development and economic project uh, progress. I think, I mean, although indices and metrics are and reporting and trends are critical to be thinking about, we, I think, also have to be considering what this future looks like and feels like on a day-to-day -day basis for most of the residents of our city. Um, we know there's an incredible disparity today, I think, in terms of what it looks like. And so we need to be really consulting with and listening with the folks who have a sense of what that will feel like going forward. Thank you, Naya. Well said. Um, we'll head to you next, Mike. Yeah, and uh, thanks again to all the organizers for, for putting this on and uh, for all the attendees and, of course, the panelists. You know, great discussions. Um, great to learn so much uh, today. Um, you know, my final thought is really you know, again, I, I'm, you know, being in tech, uh, you know, I just, I see just how much of an impact that is having on, on shaping um, where the city is going, uh, that outsized impact, you know, there's a reason there's a the cliche of, you know, tech likes to disrupt things, right? Um, you know, but kind of connecting it back to, you know, that impact um, and a lot of my work that I do outside of my day job uh, into Chinatown and the preservation, conservation of character neighborhoods, uh, and that Chinatown really serving as a, as a almost a you know 
uh, you know, I don't know if it's a canary in the coal mines, uh, so to speak, of some of the other neighborhoods in, in town uh, that are seeing a hollowing, hollowing out of character. Um, so, you know, I just want to reiterate the need that the, you know, that the community and the city, you know, need to do to come together to help ensure that, you know, you know, as people talked about the livability in these neighbors, how does, how do they feel, you know, versus, you know, the shell of a city where it's just going to be haves and haves nots. Thanks guys. Mm -hmm. Thanks Mike. Johanna. Uh, so yes, I just want to echo the thanks to everybody, the organizers, hosts, uh, panelists, and the attendees. Um, uh, and I just, uh, want to reiterate a little what I said before about having some hope coming into the future. I think we are at a crossroads. If we aren't going to pay attention now, uh, if we're not going to make change now, as we all say, COVID has laid bare the giant inequities. Uh, we can't turn a blind eye to it anymore. So I want to see this as a chance to actually make the change that we've been looking for for so long. If we don't do it now, I don't know when we ever are going to. So coming out of this, um, can we prove that we're good enough to uh, create real just recovery? I believe we're up for the challenge and I believe we can do it uh, together. Thank you. Thanks, Johanna. Charles. Yeah, thank you again for the opportunity. And um, it was, um, I was really uplifted by a, a lot of the comments and remarks, almost all the comments and the remarks that were made. And I'll probably just reiterate what I said at the end of my presentation, you know, let's be bold, not boring. And then uh, I want to also add, you know, let's have the difficult conversations in a respectful way. And, uh, you know, I always look at those opportunities as one to, you know, help inform and make someone aware of, uh, you know, my thoughts and that. I, I know I shut down uh, when people get abusive or, uh, or aren't willing to listen to other perspectives. Um, so uh, just my advice. I hope it's not too preachy, but you know, let's have those difficult conversations, but do it in a, a respectful way. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. Carol Ann. Hi, thank you everyone. Thank you for the invitation to participate. It was very interesting to hear a broad spectrum of perspective. I started um, my talk uh, reflecting on how we are influenced by our landscape. And I end with, the formative concept that new normal is that Indigenous nations in this city are changing the landscape of the city itself, and that is the new normal we need to get ready for. Um, the collective of the three nations are changing the landscape of this city, and if, unless we plan for that, unless we plan for that success, unless we plan for successful economic relationships, um, it, it makes that pathway more difficult. And I, up, uh, I hold up my hands to uh, my relative uh, Chief Ian Campbell in the leadership of th what we see as those results today are very much multi-generational. And this is a multi-generational undertaking and uh, realizing that influence and paying attention to that is one of the most important things that we can do is shifting um, the balance of the socioeconomic relationship and bringing that into our future. Vancouver is a natural leader in terms of inserting that visual and um, reflection of unceded territory, of bringing reconciliation into processes, uh, a world-class airport that reflects um, Indigenous inclusion and reality. And centering ourselves in that relationship and in that leadership is one of the most important things that this city is going to do in an ongoing constructive manner. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, and lastly, we have Julia. Uh, yes, likewise, I'd like to thank everyone for joining and, and for being invited to speak amongst so many brilliant speakers. Um, I would end by saying that maybe building on something that Naya said about the need for disruption at City Hall, that was a phrase that stuck with me. And I think that it's important that this city uh, remain not just inclusive or accommodating to the people who can really bring that disruption, but they should be elevated, they should be at the table. So anyone that is marginalized at the city who will be impacted by the policies that are made, um, who have perhaps you know, lived on the margins of these conversations, they should, they should be here. Thanks.
Thanks, Thanks so much to, uh, to everyone who's um, made this event possible. Thanks, first of all, to the panelists. Um, thanks to Andy and to and to Gil for um, for their uh, contributions. Uh, Veronica, it's been a pleasure to work with you um, on this. I also want to thank the Public Square, SFU Public Square folks in the in the um, in the background who really kept this uh, going. Um, the Office of uh, Community Engagement, Urban Studies Program, City Program, um, as well, of course, as the City and uh, the City uh, Vancouver Economic Commission. Um, it's really been a pleasure. Thanks to the students, the volunteers in the background who've, uh, who've been keeping this going. And thanks to all of you for, um, for staying with us. Um, we're 10 minutes over time and we're probably just scratching the surface. Yeah, and um, the Padlet boards will stay open for about another half hour if you want to continue engaging that way. Um, and as well, there's other ways of keeping the conversation going. There's conversation kits that you can pick up to, to specifically keep the conversation going um, about the Vancouver plan. I know I've seen some at the libraries and there's a list here of where you could find one. Um, and in terms of keeping the conversation going in this series, in the future we want, the change we need, the next event is happening on March 4th at 6.30. Um, and it's all about reimagining city streets and the public realm toward the green and connected city. Um, huge thanks again to, to especially to the panelists and to everyone for staying a few minutes over time and we'll see you next time.